so first of all, in light of the conventions of, um, of this conference, I want to first thank the organizers, um, of whom there are a Brazilian apparently out here, uh, but particularly Barack. Uh, for putting this together. Um, as everyone has said, it's always a delight to come to Israel uh, in the summer when it's hot as can be. Uh, and, um, and further to the conventions, um, uh, which, and this started from the very beginning, I want to urge you to come, and Dan too wants to urge you to come send your students to NYU Law School. So that really is the place to go. Uh, actually, there's some former students uh, in, in this audience which shows that it's the place to go because they learned enough. Well, they did learn enough not to come. I don't know. Uh, so they learned enough to come, and uh, it, it, we really have a great program. Now, um, so let's, that's it, right? Yeah. Um, it's all pick. What? <laughs> no, I don't, want to, I don't want to embarrass them. I mean, everyone would stand. You know who you are. Uh, I'm looking around. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, starting out with uh, Michal's question, which is this uh, general uh, tension between uh, intellectual property and antitrust. Um, and um, I'll start out this way. Uh, some say that actually the goals of intellectual property law and of antitrust law, in some sense, are the same. Uh, both legal regimes seek to incentivize innovation. So really, there's no tension. Of course, we all know whenever anyone says there's really no tension, um, it means there really is tension, uh, but we're pretending there isn't. So there is tension um, in uh, a number of different ways. And we start out, um, so Michal said, we all know as antitrust people that um, patents don't confer monopoly. Uh, our US Supreme Court has even said it. After many years, um, appearing to say just the opposite, and often referring, and still even after that decision, referring to uh, patents as monopolies. Uh, so even conceptually, um, we've stepped away from it as an economic matter, if we ever had it. There's still that residual notion um, that patents are uh, monopolies, um, even though they're not, they just confer an exclusive right. Of course, patents. Um, the intellectual property system favors, let's say, monopolies, and antitrust is anti-monopoly. Uh, so it sort of sets up that tension in, in some sense. Um, so the tension, I think, first of all, um, is in a basic notion of what the drivers of innovation are. Um, and interestingly enough, I think uh, Dennis started out by talking about um, the uh, emphasizing the process of competition. Um, and, you know, antitrust people at their core believe in this process of competition. Uh, There's a recent paper by Giulio Federico, Fiona Scott Morton, and Carl Shapiro about antitrust and innovation. And they say greater rivalry, meaning greater contestability of tomorrow's sales, leads to more innovation. So rivalry is the driver of innovation. To intellectual property, particularly intellectual property rights holders, that's actually not the paradigm. Uh, the paradigm is monopoly profit. So monopoly profit is critical. Um, and uh, in fact, often um, people stress that intellectual property rights are given on utilitarian grounds, that they're given to the extent that they incentivize through the grant of some sort of right that will give you hopefully monopoly profits that they incentivize innovation. And that's why um, that's why they're given out. So in a way we have, um, should we say, naive Adam Smithism uh, versus naive Joseph Schumpeterism. Uh, you know, we love rivalry from antitrust. Uh, Schumpeter wrote, uh, monopoly profits are the baits that lure capital down untried trails. A great line, right? That's, that's what gives us innovation. Um, and for, at least for some uh, intellectual property rights theorists and for holders, um, the idea actually is to, you know, as much as possible, the social benefits of innovation, and we heard aspects of that in our earlier discussion, you know, innovation is really critical to economic progress, the social benefits, the spillover benefits, 
um, that innovators confer on, uh, on society mean that um, we should do our best not just to give them profits, but as much as possible. Or as I sometimes like to think, there's an old expression, um, actually it was on a bar in New York City on Fifth Avenue, it was, um, but it was uh, sort of on this, the second floor. Too much is not enough. Um, and, and that's a basic view. So this is intention of antitrust, which actually uh, is somewhat parsimonious with regard to intellectual property rights. So two, two ways that this matters, and I think in terms of actually some of our discussion that we've had already. So um, there are different views about the uh, benefits of collaboration. Uh, so um, antitrust enforcers, of course, um, are often concerned about collaborating, about combining research and development ventures, for example, um, or combining to set standards uh, that this is going to lead to collusion or our favorite word, cartels. Um, and, you know, we heard some discussion about that for platforms earlier. Um, IP rights holders have a different view, I think, of collaboration. So the view may be that um, uh, exchanging information uh, actually helps the innovation process, um, that separate tracks for innovation, research, and development uh, can be wasteful and inefficient, uh, that we do better when science, for example, is done more collaboratively. Um, we reduce transactions costs, um, in part due to uh, the problem of how intellectual property rights are given out. So there's a, you know, this shows up in um, an appreciation, perhaps somewhat greater than, um, in into, than in any trust for collaboration and for standard setting, which we're going to talk about. Um, also different views of mergers. So we did hear, actually Sharon began the discussion by saying how, how important it is for Israel to, um, to allow um, uh, startups to be acquired by big companies. That's where you know, a lot of wealth comes from. There's a lot of talk in the United States today about being quite concerned about those kinds of mergers, um, that you know, these may be upstart technologies that uh, get suppressed by having be acquired by major companies. So there's a tension in, um, in view of mergers and IP rights holders may want a more permissive view. Um, and um, finally, there's um, actually, time, but um, there's a, a somewhat underappreciated um, difference in the institutional arrangement for enforcing antitrust and enforcing intellectual property rights. Um, so um, we, we tend, in the antitrust community, we tend to talk about um, how um, enforcement is dispersed. We've got a lot of different countries, different um, public enforcers. But for intellectual property, it's actually radically dispersed. There is no central repository for having a government view about intellectual property across the spectrum patents, copyrights, trade secrets. Um, governments basically exist to grant the rights, but not to enforce them. So they're enforced privately. Um, and the incentives are private incentives in terms of whether to enforce them or not. Um, so the only public enforcers in a sense, you want to think about it this way, that get involved in intellectual property rights um, are antitrust enforcers. Uh, so it creates an interesting institutional way of looking um, at uh, intellectual uh, property rights. So try to keep that in mind. Um, and of course, I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll not end with that. I'm gonna end with this. Um, uh, the two regimes do overlap, and we, sh we also shouldn't lose sight of that. So intellectual property has within it doctrines that um, actually do limit the ability of intellectual property rights holders to exploit their rights. So there are various doctrines, you know, whether it's exhaustion or first sale, um, or fair use in copyright, um, uh, post-expiration royalties are not allowed. There are various ways of limiting that. And antitrust, of course, tries to um, expand a little bit to take account of intellectual property rights and give rights holders some chance 
uh, to exploit those rights and um, gain the um, you know some degree of monopoly rents to pay for innovation and incentivizing. Thank you very much. I think before we uh, open it to a debate here, I will ask uh, one more question to uh, Professor. Uh, uh, well, patent protection raises various antitrust uh, issues. Uh, I want to ask you if you think is it, it is uh, justified for the aim of uh, promoting innovation, uh, is patent protection is misused, and uh, in what circumstances? Uh, thank you, and I also thank everyone uh, for being here and uh, organizing a wonderful conference. Before I answer the question, I do want to let you know that this is actually um, probably about my seventh visit to Israel. <coughs> but on one of my prior visits, when I was serving as a deputy uh, chief economist at Justice Department, uh, I gave a talk. And after I gave a talk about about IP and antitrust, <coughs> um, it was alleged that David Tadmor, the then head of the Competition Authority, and I had colluded to uh, present to uh, to get the Israeli Competition Authority to sue Microsoft, <coughs> which we were investigating at the time. So this is the 20th anniversary of David's and my collusive activity, and we celebrate it every four or five years. It's not here now, because otherwise I would have a toast to my fellow collude. Uh, for the record, we actually did not collude, but it prevented us They from, always say that. <laughs> but for five years, David and I were not speaking, because we were afraid that the fact that we spoke would be that we and so anyway, David, it's a, a toast to you. So uh, I agree with uh, much of what Harry said. Uh, the, the main point is that uh, <clears throat> antitrust and IP are both concerned. Uh, concerned with, uh, maybe she's, uh, antitrust and IP which are, are concerned with innovation. So there, uh, there's a, often in many cases a positive correlation between our goals of antitrust and our goals of, <coughs> of IP. There are, however, a number of, of occasions where the two come into conflict. And usually, from my point of view, it, it goes to the issue of the scope of the IP. I'm still bouncing that for you. There must be something about my voice. Uh, it goes to the issue of the scope of the IP. If the IP holder is expanding the scope of the IP beyond what might be deemed to be reasonable, uh, that's when the antitrust enforcers have something hard to think about. Can folks still hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so what I want to do is take a few minutes to you to, uh, to give an example of where I think uh, this tension really has become important and will be more important in the future and that's in the area of pharmaceuticals. And <clears throat> before I do, I want to say that, uh, just for the record, I am involved in quite a few, more than two or three pharmaceutical cases as a private consultant. Uh, nothing I say today should be seen as actually characterizing any of the, uh, any of the pharma companies with which I've been affiliated. And also, not, nothing I say has anything specifically to do with Teva. Um, which a company, this company may have heard of. So, uh, so the issue arises, has arised historically uh, and uh, brought about by the practice of, uh, of a lot of brand name pharmaceutical companies to find ways to delay generic entry because usually the generic enters, particularly if they're more than one, of a relatively low price, very good for consumers, but not so good for the patent holder. And as most of you know, there have been many, there's been a lot of litigation attacking that practice leading to a Supreme Court decision in which the court said that uh, the practices of uh, so-called reverse payments, payments made by the, by the brand, the generic, uh, will be seen as anti-competitive, at least uh, if there is actually a flow of dollars in the right direction, that will be seen as, uh, as anti-competitive and will shift the burden to the defense to, to argue otherwise. So these reverse patent cases have been brought quite extensively. The FTC has been successful in, in this most recent case. Uh, but not surprisingly, the pharma companies have evolved. They've learned that uh, uh, some of these reverse patent cases are not going to 
in the future, and we were looking for different <coughs> strategies to try to, to uh, expand the scope of their patent. And the, and the practice that uh, I've been involved with initially in this regard involves what, what uh, I would call uh, product hopping. Sorry about the bouncing. Uh, product hopping. Product hopping. This is going to be a little better. I think you might want to just stand over here and talk. It's good to stand up. This is my contribution to the 